And uh, greetings from the Dallas County Cowboy Church, and I want to compliment that band. I'm telling you, I enjoy that. That is great. Good, good band. One of these days, Gary, we need to just have a Sunday where we swap bands or something. Like that. And you need to get to hear our band, and we're, I'm delighted. I'm thankful to be here with you today. I appreciate Gary's invitation to come and share with you. And I brought a, a, a small team with me that are going to, I'll introduce them in just a little bit. We're going to break out and give you some some one-on-one -on -one, uh uh, time to ask questions and, and, and get some answers that you may be needing. But we're honored that you would ask us to come and be with you today. And let me say, we are not here to tell you what to do. We are here to tell you how we do it and explain the cowboy model. And I believe that's what you have in hand. Is that, is that what they have, Gary? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to read that. I couldn't read it. If I have to, my folks know that I'm almost blind, and so I can't I can't read it anyway. And so, uh, but I'm just going to share with you from my heart today, and uh, talk to you about Cowboy Church. One of the greatest thrills that ever came into my life was Cowboy Church. I preached this morning from Philippians, where Paul said to the Philippian church, "You are my joy and my crown." And the Philippian church to Paul was the crown and the joy of his ministry. And I said in 40 years of ministry, the Cowboy Church has been the joy and the crown of all these years of ministry. And um, Gary has been with us from the very, very beginning. Just a real brief little history of how our church came to be. I was in Montana pastoring a traditional church in Montana where I'd been for about 18 years when the Dallas Baptist Association decided to put a cowboy church in the Dallas Metroplex area. So they got together with three churches, Lakeside Baptist Church, where Gary served for many, many years, and then First Baptist Church in Sunnyvale and Shiloh Terrace Baptist Church, and then the association, the Baptist General Convention of Texas, said we want to have a part of this. We began with five people. My wife and I made seven. We met in a home. In a few weeks, we outgrew that home and uh, moved to the Fellowship Hall of Lakeside Baptist Church. It wasn't long until we outgrew it. And then we went to a theater in Mesquite. This church was planted over in the Mesquite area because of the Western heritage associated with Mesquite Championship Rodeo. And so, we met in a theater called Rodeo City Music Hall. Pretty soon outgrew it, and then moved to the property that we now are in. Uh, we have 12 and a half acres, a building about the size of this right here. We can seat about 175, and uh, we quickly outgrew it and had to go to two services, and then we had to go to three services. And so uh, that's been our history and growth. We're now over 400. We're four years old, and we're over 400 on our way to 450 and 500. We have plans to build a building that will seat 700 or 750 people. But the Lord has blessed, and, and, and our cowboy church has been done right from the beginning. Gary Wagner was very, very much a part of that. The churches that sponsored our cowboy church were very, they were traditional big Dallas Baptist churches, and they said to me, when I came to start the Dallas County Cowboy Church, they said, we want to know if you will lead it to become a cowboy church and follow the model of, at that time, the Texas Fellowship of Cowboy Churches, now the American Fellowship of Cowboy Churches because we have outgrown Texas and there are cowboy churches all across the land. And I said, yes, I will follow. They said, well, will you go to the cowboy school and learn the model? And I said, yes, I will. So I went to that school, learned the model, signed a covenant with those churches that I would lead the cowboy church to be a cowboy church and follow the model. Now, if you're not going to follow the model, they said to me, and others have said to me, then you're just another Baptist church 
that people wear hats in. I said, no, we want to be a cowboy church. They said, that's what we want. So, I learned that model, went to a number of schools, and since then have been asked to teach and participate in ranch house schools in leading folks to know, like I had to learn, reinvent myself. And I, I reinvented myself. I've been a pastor in a traditional Baptist church for, for over 30 years. And I had to reinvent myself. The gospel doesn't change. The Word of God never changes, but the approach and the style and the worship and the way you do church and cowboy church is uniquely different. But folks, it works. It works. And it reaches into a segment of people that other churches are not reaching. And we need all kinds of churches. I am not against traditional church. I am grateful for the heritage and the background and the training and the experience that the Lord gave me through those traditional churches. We need all of the churches to reach all of the folks. Paul said, I have become all things to all men that by all means, whatever it takes, Paul was saying, I will reach some people for Christ. And the Cowboy Church is doing a wonderful job. God is using it to reach into a segment of society that other churches are not reaching. The cowboy culture. Now here's the amazing thing. As the cowboy church reaches into the cowboy western heritage culture, whether you be a hardcore working cowboy or a rodeo cowboy or a person who likes country western music or likes to wear a cowboy hat and Levi jeans or whatever, as the cowboy church reaches into the, the, the cowboy culture, there are wagon loads of other people who say, man, I like that. I want to go to a cowboy church. And so you reach more than just cowboy, but you've got to hear me on this. What makes it work is you've got to keep it cowboy. Keep it cowboy. And I'm going to go over that with you and, 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 and share with you a little bit how the cowboy church works. Someone said that for the cowboy church, it ought not to look like a church. And I love your building. And I understand you, you're going to be moving. But make it cowboy. Keep it culturally relevant to the Western heritage. Y'all have done a wonderful job here. I love this. This is cowboy setup. It ought not to look like a church. Someone said, it ought not to smell like a church. <laughs> cowboy church is designed for that old working cowboy that comes in from feeding or ranching or whatever, and he feels very comfortable. We trade the stained glass windows for stained concrete. And we keep it where the cowboy can come in and he can come in in his boots and his western wear or his work clothes or his overalls or whatever and he doesn't feel out of place. It don't look like a church, it don't smell like a church, and it don't sound like a church. Because you don't have a choir and a pipe organ. you got a band and y'all got a good one. I love your band. And so keep it, keep it cowboy. Keep it. And the cowboys will come, and other folks will too, because they love church that way. There are folks, and again, I'm not against traditional church. Don't ever hear me say that. But there, there are lots and lots and lots of folks out there who've grown weary of church that is not real and relevant to them anymore. Or they've been hurt, they've been disappointed, and they've dropped out. And one by one, family by family, they come to Cowboy Church and their faith is renewed. The flame burns again. And it's all because of the Cowboy Church way of doing things. I don't know if you know this, but recently in Texas Baptist, of all the baptisms that were turned in by all the Baptist churches, 
all of them, in the state of Texas, a full 10% of the baptisms that were turned in by all the churches now, 10% of those baptisms were turned, were turned in by some 130 or 40 cowboy churches. Now, let's go a step further. Of those baptisms, 10% of the whole state turned in by a handful of cowboy churches. It says how many people they're reaching. Of those baptisms, 70% were adults. 70% of the baptisms in cowboy churches were adults. And that says something. And then, take it one step further, 70% of those were also men. It's the men in cowboy churches that are being reached first. It's the men who are saying, Honey, I want to go to church. I want to go to that cowboy church. And I want my family to go. And ladies, thank God for that. Men are leading the way of the baptism. 70% of them are men and, and men and adults. Adults, 70% of that is men and the other 30% is women and children. So the cowboy church is, is working. It's doing a wonderful, wonderful ministry. Now let's talk about how the cowboy church does that ministry. Now, I want to invite you at any point to just raise your hand up and say, i got a question. And if you do, I'll try to answer it. We're going to go to some breakout sessions, and then we may come back, Gary said, later for a more question and answer time. Our goal here today is to help you. To help you become one of the strongest, most vibrant cowboy churches in this part of the country. Let's talk about the cowboy church model. As you read the New Testament, and you see the Apostle Paul planting churches, you will read in the book of Titus and other places where Paul, as he planted these churches, he set up elders. And he talks about the elders. Now the reason that Paul did this, I believe, is in the early days of the New Testament church, they didn't have seminary yet. They didn't have Bible college yet. And in the beginning of the church, there were some men who were being called of God into the pastorate, but there were not that many of them. We know a few of them. Timothy and Titus were a few that worked with Paul. But Paul was planting more churches than there were available pastors. So what Paul did is he asked these churches and he set up in each of the churches some elders. Now the elders were men of spiritual maturity. They were wise, uh, good, strong in their faith. Usually very gentle, kind of laid back, observers. And these elders led those churches in the absence of a pastor. Paul was a circuit riding. He'd come around and he and the elders would, would meet and, and, and lead that church. And when Paul was gone, the elders would continue to lead the church. And so, the cowboy church follows that model. We have elders in the church. The cowboy model represents or recommends that each cowboy church have three. Three elders. They are not ordained, but they are men recognized by the, con by the congregation as men of maturity, men of stability, men who've got their head on straight, men who have wisdom and gentleness. And there are three. They are, they are on a revolving three-year basis. When you, when you first set them up, one serves three years, one serves two years, and one serves one year. Each year, one rotates off. And the church elects a new elder, and then everybody steps down a notch. The next one serves two more years, and then he's off. And the one who started with three years, eventually he rotates off. So every year, you, you elect a new elder. Now, in our church, the way we do that, 
is our church has said we would like the pastor who works with the elders and the existing elders to come up with nominations for new elders rather than take it from the floor. Now let me tell you why. And I think, it, I think it's good. If you take nominations from the floor, you may nominate, I'm going to give an example, you may nominate Bill, and, and you may think Bill would make a great elder. And then he's going to be examined by the pastor and the other elders, not on, not on whether or not he's their friend or anything like that, but his qualification and his willingness to serve as an elder. And Bill, when he's approached, may say, no, there, there's something coming up in my situation. It could be a thousand reasons. He'd say, I'd rather wait. Right now, I don't want to serve as an elder. Now, if you've nominated him from the floor, then everybody says, well, why didn't Bill serve? See what I'm saying? So we reverse that. And the pastor and the elders, we, we talk to different men and say, could you be an elder? Would you be willing to be an elder? And if they are, then their name goes on a, a nomination ballot. And we ask the church to choose one or two of those. We're going to have to choose two this year because one of our elders is moving and one is rotating off. So we'll, we'll have a list of names and we'll ask our church, you get to make the decision, and the two in our church this year that, that, are, that are most uh, selected by a, a secret ballot of the, of the congregation in about two weeks will become the two new elders. And we do it that way to save embarrassment to a man who gets nominated and all of a sudden his name is all over the floor and he don't want to serve or he's unwilling or he can't serve or whatever. So we do it that way. Now, but what do the elders do, you say? Well, the elders are the sounding board for the pastor. I work with my elders. I'm very close to them. I don't love them any more than I do any other member of the church. But when I have an idea, or when I have a direction that I'd like to see the church go, first, I get with my elders. And I say, guys, let me tell you about something I've been thinking about. And I'll lay it out for them and, and bounce it around. They are a sounding board for me. I don't have all wisdom. I, I, I'm not infallible. Boy, a lot of times they'll say, you know, Pastor Mike, that's a good idea, but have you thought about this? And I go, no, I didn't think about that. And so we'll bend it a little bit. We'll twist it or we'll tweak it a little bit. Now, they don't make a decision. They only help me get it more clear, if you will. The elders play a role. Get this. A R-O-L-E. It's a role, not a rule. Not a R-U-L-E. Elders never make a decision. In fact, the model says they can't make decisions. They don't make decisions. But they have a role a role of working with the pastor to kind of keep the ship going in, in the right direction. When I have bounced my idea off of my elders and, and we kind of got it to where we think, hey, this sounds like a pretty good idea. Well, what are we going to do next? Just do it? Oh, no, 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 no. That's a church decision. <coughs> we always bring it to the church and say the pastor and the elders have prayerfully thought about this idea for your consideration. And we'll, we'll lay it out to the church. And hopefully, we have filtered it, we have taken some of the bugs out of it, we've tweaked it a little bit, and the church then can get a hold of it and make the decision. The elders play a role, R-O-L-E. Not a rule. They do not make the decision. The church makes the decision. Let me tell you another role that the elders play. They hold, the, they hold the pastor accountable. They are my accountability people. And 
they are the ones who they're my prayer partners and and I'll meet with them and, and they may say pastor do you realize that your sermons are getting longer and longer and longer and we need to hold it to an hour I say guys thank you I didn't okay they are my accountability partners they hold me accountable <laughs> another role that they play they are the peacemakers in the church every church has its little problems and that's because we're all human beings we're all sinners saved by grace we all are human and we're going to have some problems now in traditional church those problems often just fester and grow and get bigger and they mold and they sour until they split the church Cowboy Church is not short on discipline. It is not short on, on taking care of problems. And here is the role of the elders. Follow me, I'll make it very simple. If two people out here in the parking lot back up and hit each other, and, 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 and they've got a little hurt feeling toward each other. You backed up and hit my, you backed up and hit my right finger. Well, elders don't get involved in that. That's between them two people. But in the church, if there is a, a, a problem that is affecting the fellowship, it is affecting the ministry, it is affecting the direction of the church. The elders will get together with the pastor. They will prayerfully evaluate this, whatever this situation, this problem is. They will come together as one voice with a consensus. And they will go to the person or the family or the whatever it is and say, could we sit down and talk? We'll sit down. And we say, you know, we have a problem here. The people have noticed, or people are saying, or we can't help but understand. We see this, and, and the elders play a role, a R-O-L-E, a role in trying to help solve this problem. They say, could we suggest to you that you do A, B, C, and that'll make everything be okay? If the person says, no, I'm digging in, and I'm not going to do that, the elders say, well, okay. Matthew 18 says, we need to take it to the next step. And that's take it to a leadership team. And I'm going to get to a leadership team. That's a little bit bigger group. And the leadership team would hear the problem. They would hear the counsel that the elders tried to give to that problem, but it still didn't solve it. So now the leadership team is going to speak to it and say, hey, we agree with the elders. You need to do A, B, C. The person says, I'm not going to do it. Where does it go now? It goes to the whole church. The church hears it, and the church speaks the final word and says, this is what you're going to do or you're not going to be a member because you're not going to tear up the fellowship of this church. So it ultimately comes back to the church body. But the beauty, the beauty of the cowboy church model is this. The elders and the pastor confidentially, privately, play a role in trying to solve this problem. If they can't, then it goes to the next body and finally to the whole church. But what always happens is, with godly men of wise counsel and gentle spirit who prayed about it, who will go and address a problem, usually that takes care of it. And it's done. It's over. And it's not splattered all over the church. It doesn't disrupt the fellowship. And the problem is solved. You say, well, what if the problem is the preacher? What if the preacher is out of line? The elders have a role to sit down with the pastor and say, Pastor, uh, the way you have spoken to this lady or the way you've treated them is not right. And I might say, you know, guys, you're right. <laughs> you're right. 
I need to ask her to forgive me for him. End the problem. I might say, well, I don't care. I ain't speaking to her no more. The elders will say, Pastor, I believe you, you need to you need to put this behind you. You need to forgive her. You need to ask her to forgive you, whatever it is, and you need to end this. I say, nope, I'm not going to do it. But go to the leadership team. Leadership team speaks to the pastor the same way. I say, I ain't going to do it. Go up to the congregation. The church says, Pastor, either you do it or we get a new pastor. End of problem. The church always has the final say. But before it has to go to that level, the elders and the leadership team would have a role in trying to solve the problem. And that's one of the roles of the elder. And it's never a rule. It's only a role that they play as men of wisdom and gentleness and Christ-like spirit who want to head off some problem. And believe me, if you're a church, as you are, with saved, sinners saved by grace, you're going to have some problems. We all do. But when the church learns and the fellowship understands, the pastor and the elders will handle this. And with, 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 they'll try to solve it. If they can't, it'll come to this level and finally to this level. And when the church speaks to it, that's the final word. That's it. It's over. But hopefully it doesn't have to go that far. So that's, that's what the elders do. I have two elders in my church that if I need to, I can call on them to preach for me. I'm going to have surgery this coming week. So next Sunday I won't be able to preach. I already have asked one of my elders, will you preach for me? He said, sure, I'll be glad to. He's quite able to do that. So he'll be preaching next Sunday in our church. That's a role of the elders. Okay? Now let's move to something else that the Cowboy Church has. The Cowboy Church has three elders. They are on a rotating basis. One each year rotates off. And the church elects a new one who will, who will begin with a three-year term. But let's talk about lay pastors. Elders are elected by the church. Lay pastors are appointed by the pastor in the cowboy model. I'm going to tell you why. But first, what is a lay pastor? Well, in traditional church, you're used to the word deacon. And the word deacon comes from the Greek in the Bible, diakonos or diakon. It, they just said, well, the English equivalent of that is deacon. But when you read in Acts chapter 6, about the calling forth of the deacons. You'll understand if you read it, the very simple meaning is, as the church grew, the pastor was not able to meet the needs of everybody. And some of the people began to feel neglected. I didn't get Shaky's hand. I didn't get what I needed. The pastor wasn't able to be there when I needed him. Well, he can't be in four places at once. So, the early church elected men who would serve as deacons, diacon, which simply means a lay pastor. Men who are going to help the pastor do the ministry of the church. And all of a sudden, in that church in Jerusalem, people no longer felt neglected. Why? Because of the lay pastors were helping meet those needs. They were praying with people. They were visiting with people. They were with them when they got sick and when they needed something. I'm sure they told the pastor, Sister Bertha is going to have surgery this week. And she wanted me to tell you that. Okay? And now the pastor knows it. But had it not been for a lay pastor, I might not have known that. Now in our church, the lay pastors are appointed by the pastor. And the reason for that is, I want men that I know will work in ministry. They'll be willing to be servants. They'll be willing to minister to people and pray with people. And they do not meet. There is no such thing as a lay pastor meeting like you would think of a deacon's meeting. 
They don't run the church. You run the church. They're there to do ministry. They're there to help the pastor meet the needs of the people. And there is no such thing as a lay pastor meeting every month or anything like that. Now, if they want to get together and eat hot dogs or barbecue, that's okay. But there's no such thing as a business meeting of lay pastors. Because they don't conduct the business. You do. They don't do that. In our church, our lay pastors, we have one lay pastor for about every 35 to 40 people. So, so you can see the number of lay pastors that we have. And what I am leading our lay pastors to do is to position. We're going to get them shirts. That, that are, all their shirts will be alive. And in our new building, when we get it built, they'll seat 700 or whatever we can get in it. We'll have sections that a lay pastor will say, Lloyd, this is your section right here. Chris, this is your section right here. Robert, this is your section right here. And Sunday by Sunday, they will be at that particular place. And I know in a smaller building, this is not quite as important, but it will be. Because you're going to grow. You're going to grow. I promise you, you're going to grow. Those lay pastors will be at, at their particular section in the auditorium. They will act like ushers. They will greet the people. They'll say, welcome to Cowboy Church. How are you doing? How have you been? How's your daughter doing? How's that son that you told us was, was whatever it was? And they just simply visit and react with those people. Now here's what happens, and it's happening in our church. The people say to the lay pastor, would you tell Brother Mike that I need him to call me this week? I've got a problem. Or would you tell Brother Mike that, that my husband is going to go in the hospital this week for some tests? I want to know that the pastor knows about it. They are confident that that lay pastor is going to tell me and usually the lay pastor and I together will go to that hospital if he's able to go. If not, then I'll go. But that's what they do. They keep people from feeling like they're neglected, that nobody knows. I, I can't get to the pastor. He's so busy. And, but I tell my lay pastor. And a, a beautiful thing is happening in our church. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody in our church and you'll see a lay pastor with his arm around him and he's got his hat on. You know what he's doing? He's praying with them. They said, oh, would you pray for me? Would you pray for my son who is in Iraq? Would you pray for my daughter? She's going through a divorce or whatever it may be. That lay pastor will say, let's pray right now. And he'll have prayer with him. And then he's, he's going to be sure and tell me so I can follow up. So they help me with my ministry. And that's the lay pastor job. That one for every 30 or 40 people, however you want to do it. They are not ordained. And uh, in the cowboy church, we don't put we don't put the um, the restraint on these guys like some churches do with a deacon. Uh, you, you want him to be a good moral, spiritual man. You want him to be an example. But, but, but folks, there are some wonderful men. And hear me. There are some wonderful, godly men who have gone through a divorce or something in their background, even before they knew the Lord. And they, they'll never serve, probably, as a deacon. But in a cowboy church, God can use them if they have a heart to be a servant to people and love people and just care about them and look them in the eye and listen to them and help the pastor know. Now, the reason they are appointed is if a lay pastor is not doing his ministry. He's not doing it. I appointed him as a lay pastor, and he hadn't been here in six weeks. He don't even come to church. Shows up every once in a while. I'm going to unappoint him. And I'm going to do it privately. Not going to be a church matter. Not going to be a big hoopla. I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't depend on you. Maybe next year would be a better year for you to be a lay pastor. I've appointed someone else. And I can unappoint them lay pastors. So they know they need to do their job. But they do it joyfully. They love it. They are at their place. They're ready to go. They're looking. And their people are beginning to know them. And they like pastor this little section of the people right here. 
and another pastor is this little section over here. They're like fingers. They all relay it back to the senior pastor so that I, as their pastor, can know what their need is. But I couldn't do it without my lay pastors. Because you see, in Cowboy Church, we don't hire extra staff. We don't have associates and children's minister and youth minister and music minister. And besides, your music minister would never do as good as your baby. <laughs> never. So you need these lay pastors. Let me tell you one more thing the lay pastors do. In the Cowboy Church, we have teams. I meant to start with this, but I'm going to give it to you right here in the middle. And if you don't remember anything else that I give you today, I want you to remember this. The heart, the core of the Cowboy Church model is this. Team empowerment with accountability. Team empowerment with accountability. Let's break it down. You know what a team is. That's like a committee. Except in Cowboy Church, we call it a team. Team empowerment. You have the authority as a team to do your job, but with accountability. Who are you accountable to? The congregation. You are accountable to the people of the church for what your team does. Now, you have, you have, and I brought with me a hospitality team. I appoint a hospitality team leader. The pastor and the elders appoint team leaders and lay pastors. Our hospitality team leader is a lady back here named Marcia Gill. You're going to meet her in a minute. What a wonderful, wonderful job she has done with her team. I said, Marcia, would you be the team leader for hospitality? She said, yes. I said, put together your team. Find out people who want to do that work and you are empowered to get her done. Just do it. But remember, you are accountable to the church for what you do. You must submit a budget from your team, a budget request that goes into the larger budget of the church. And what you do, <clears throat> you must give a report every month at the team meeting. Now that's the leadership team. Who are they? Every time you have a team, you appoint first a team leader like Marcia. She's the team leader for hospitality. She has her own team. What have you got? Seven or eight, nine people on your team? Five. Five, okay. Oh, see, I thought she had more. See, I, I, don't, I don't run the team. I appointed, I said, you are empowered. Get your team and, and get this job done. Every month, she's at the leadership team meeting, and her, she stands up and she gives a report from her team of what they've done, what they've spent, what they need uh, for, their, for their ministry. The arena team, the cleaning team, we have a parking team. Uh, whatever teams that your church develops, the pastor and the elders appoint a team leader. You let that leader choose his or her team and empower them to do their job that they are accountable once a month at the leadership team meeting to report on what their team is doing. And that brings me to the business meetings of the Cowboy Church. When I was in traditional church all those years, we had our monthly business meeting every Sunday night, and in a church of a hundred, twelve people always attended the business meeting. Very few. Cowboy Church does it different. Cowboy Church says once a month, we are going to have a leadership team meeting. Who can come? Everybody. Everybody. It's open to everybody. But who is required to be there? All the team leaders. Marsha and, and Tommy and all the other team leaders. I'm thinking of those in our church. They are required to be at the leadership team meeting. And they each one stand up and give a report. Here's what our team did this month. Here's what we'd like to do next month. 
And the, the, the church approves that. Okay, next thing. Here's what we did last month. Here's what we'd like to do this month. Or we need this. We'd like to ask the church if we can buy this. The church and that team leadership meeting. Really, the whole church is there. Anybody that wants to. But you call it a leadership team meeting. And each team leader gives a report. And if they have one, a request for what they want to do. That's where you get everything on the calendar, month by month by month, is at the leadership team meeting. And in Cowboy Church, we do not, we do not have raise your right hand and vote. The model suggests that you have consensus. Consensus. Well, what does that mean? Well, consensus means everybody is in agreement to go this way. And at our leadership team, I don't say, okay, everybody for it, raise your right hand. Everybody against it, raise your right hand. I don't do that. That's not the cowboy way. We talk about it, and I'll say, do we do we have consensus on granting the hospitality team uh, to buy a new coffee urn next month? I can see the head, yeah, I'll say, okay. If we have consensus, then go ahead and do it. And let me give you an example of consensus. I know of a church that wanted to build something for their children. The whole church wanted to do it. But there was one couple in the church that just did not feel like they needed to spend that money. They just didn't see the need for that. And in their discussion, this, this family spoke said, I, I just, here's my opinion. I don't think we need to buy that. I don't think we need to spend that money. The rest of the church felt like, yes, we do. Our, our children need more room. So, the vote was taken, and the majority won. And then the man who opposed me stood up and said this. He said, you know, everybody, thank you, Gary. I thought you was going through to correct me. The man who had spoken against that, stood up and he said, okay, you all know that we did not feel that that's what we needed. And everybody thought, he's fixing to say, and we're leaving the church. But he said, the church has voted. And he said, I want to be the first one to donate $5,000 to the new children's bill. He gave consensus to what everybody wanted to do. Even though personally he wasn't fully convinced of it, he went along and gave consensus. So we get a consensus at the leadership team meeting once a month. Things get put on the calendar. Uh, things get requested. Each team gives a report and they've got to be there. They've got to give their report. There are only three or four things that rise to the level of a church-wide business meeting. And at that, we take a vote. Here is what they are. The approving of the annual budget that needs to be handed out, needs to be looked at, thought over, prayed over, and then the whole church approves the budget for the new year. Leadership team should not do that. That is a church-wide decision. A second one. If you're going to be in a major building program or the purchasing of property or the selling of property or the remodeling of property, leadership team should not do that. The whole church should vote on that. The calling of a pastor or the dismissing of a pastor, leadership team should not do that. The whole church should vote on that. The electing of trustees Leadership team should not do that. The whole church should elect its trustees. That's different from pastor and elders. You know what a trustee does. So there's only just a few things that rise to the level of a church-wide, all the A's, raise your hand, the nays, same sign, kind of a business unit. You don't need to do that month by month by month. Month by month by month, what you do is you just take care of keeping the machine running, keeping the, keeping the cowboy church moving through your team. What's the core? Team empowerment with accountability. 
Everything, everything in the cowboy church is done by a team. Even the pastor. What is his team? The elders are his team. The pastor and elders are a team. The lay pastors are a team. The hospitality is a team. The parking is a team. Uh, the arena is a team. The children's ministry is a team. The ladies' ministry is a team. The men's ministry is a team. The youth ministry is a team. And each team, month by month, gives their report, their calendar, and or their request. And by consensus, we quickly move, 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 move. Our leadership team meeting usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes in a church running 400. But we just hear from the team. I say, okay, Martha, it's your turn. What about hospitality? She'll stand up and tell me what she needs. There may be no decision. I'll say, okay, children's ministry, stand up. Youth ministry, men's ministry, ladies' ministry, one by one. And then if the pastor and the elders have something to bring, we'll bring it and, and give our... We always have a monthly... And I'm going to move now to the most important thing in your church. We always, at the leadership team each month, we always have a monthly financial statement of the church. I brought Mr. Virgil Sandlin with me today. He is the leader of the audit team in our church. And I'm going to tell you about that team. He and his team each month prepare a financial statement that is available at leadership team and laid out on the table back there for everybody in the church. On that, it shows what was budgeted, what's been spent, and what's left. It shows the tithes and the offerings, the amount in building fund, the amount paid to debt retirement, or whatever. It shows, you say, well, how much did the hospitality team spend last month? We well, said they budgeted $200. So far they spent $125, and this month they spent another $50. It's all right there. Month by month, that is presented. And that way the church has a full month-by-month -month understanding of how much money came in, how it was spent, what we have in the bank, what we have in the savings, or however you do it. Each month that has come up. Now let, let, let me move to this. In the Cowboy Church model, and hear me on this, this is vitally important. In the cowboy church model, the pastor has nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing to do with the finances of the church. That's the way it is. In my church, the, the finance team or the audit team they sit down and, 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 and they submit to the church a pastor's salary at the beginning of each year. The church votes on that. And then, as pastor, I never, I never touch the offerings. And Sunday by Sunday, when the offerings are taken in our church, and Virgil is going to give you an excellent example and, 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 a, and a lady who's on his team named Miss Tommy Hobbs. She's the best in the West. How we do the money counting, how we have a team of people who are there to count the money and a team to observe the counters, to watch what the counters are doing. An audit team or a finance team that Virgil leads to handle the, the, the deposit and all of that and it's a team, it's never one person it's a team of people Takes he'll go over how many signatures it takes and when Sunday by Sunday when the offering is collected and taken out of the bucket or the little church box whatever you use, the team that's going to count the offering goes back in the room and guess who is not allowed to go in that room Pastor I don't want to go in there I don't want to have my money, my hands on the money of the church. I do not want to do it. And so the pastor is out of the loop 
when it comes to the handling of the finances of the church. Now, my team, I can come and I can request that this be spent or that on a new microphone or whatever, just like anybody else. But I can't get access to the money. And I never handle the money. I tell people all the time. They'll come up to me and they'll say, Brother Bud, Mike, I forgot to give my tithe. Would you take I'll say, no, I don't want to touch it. It's not mine. You give it to Virgil. You give it to one of the team members. Don't give it to me. That puts me in a bad position. It puts me in a position of any kind of accusation or misunderstanding about how the money was handled. And I do not touch nor handle the meeting or the money of the, Cal of the Dallas County Cowboy Church. I very seldom even go to the finance team meeting. They don't need me. I'm not there to tell them what to do. The church has empowered them to handle the offering and uh, apply it to the budget voted on by the church and give a monthly report of where the money is and every penny of it accounted for. And the pastor is out of that. Now, if you want to ask me, well, do you know how much money is in your savings or whatever? I know as much as any member because I can pick up the report like anybody else and say, well, let's see. Yeah, it says we got this in the building fund. But without the report, I have no way of knowing any more than anybody else. I hope that sounds good to you. Because I have seen wreck after wreck after wreck where the pastor felt like he had to control the finances of the church. That is not scriptural, it is not right, and it will end in a train wreck every time. You elect trusted people to be on the finance team. You elect money counters and people who will make your deposit. And that's what Virgil's going to go over with you. Again, not to tell you what to do, but to suggest to you how it works in our church and it and is the model of the Cowboy Church. And the pastor should stay out. He should stay out of money issues other than he gets one vote just like anybody else in the church regarding the finances and the budget and the money and the offerings of the church. And so that's very, very important that you do it that way in the cowboy model. <clears throat> and in the cowboy church, and I'm, I'm kind of running out of soap, but in the cowboy church, it's kind of like going to a branding. I see, I think, what are some real working cowboys here. I lived in Montana almost 20 years, and up there we do those big old brandings and ride for two or three days and bring the cattle in gather them in a big area, separate the mamas from their calves, and, and then it's, it's rope and drag branding, and uh, branding, you know, branding and cutting and ear notching and back, vaccinating and everything you need to do to those baby calves. But here's the deal. When you get to a branding, the rancher, the rancher says, you're qualified to to give vaccination. I want you to give vaccination. You know how to do it. You know how to cut, and, and, and I want you to do that, maybe two of them. I'm going to show you how to ear notch. I'm going to show you how to give a pill. And each one has their job. And you are empowered and expected to do it. To do it. And when everybody does their job, pretty soon all the baby calves are branded, and vaccinated, and ear notched, and got a tag in their ear, and they're ready to go. But it's because everybody did his or her job. Some of the guys knew how to rope and drag. I never knew how to do that, so I never got that job. That's okay. Let those who do, let them do that. And uh, I used to wrestle them, but then I got too fat. So I had to quit doing that. I ended up with the ear knocking job. But you know what? That was my job. And it was important. And I best do it. Or the rancher would say, I'm sorry, Mike, I've got to get somebody else. I've got to get somebody. You keep, you keep knocking the tail. I told you to knock the ear. And so, you know, that's the way it works in Cowboy Church. And it was a rancher's call, just like it is a pastor's call. 
to keep so you can get this job done and have a good time back at the ranch house. And so these are the things that, that I felt like I needed to bring to you. You will develop the teams that you need as your church grows. For a while, we didn't have a ministry lady. When there were just a few of us, we just all met together. But when we got up close to 400, or even before that, we, the ladies began to say, well, could we have a, a ladies meeting together? Well, you need, a, you need a ladies team leader for the ministry of the ladies. Then we got the men, then the children, then the youth. And so you will develop the teams that you need as your church develops. You'll know what teams you need and uh, you'll develop them according to the personality and the ministry of your own church. But the fundamentals are the pastor, the elder, the lay pastors, and the team leaders. Let them pick their own team. Among those teams is your finance team called the audit team. And it's not that they perform an audit. It's kind of a misleading name. It's that they are the ones that you entrust on your behalf excluding the pastor to handle the finances of the church, prepare a monthly report, count the offering, make the deposit, write the checks, and Virgil will give you all the safety and the backup and the, the check and balance system in that so that you not only protect your money and your offering, but you protect some individual from being falsely accused of any wrongdoing. <coughs> That's what this is all about. Gary, is there something else that maybe I'm not thinking that you'd like for me to touch on? No, but I'm just going to ask the question. Okay, any question that you have? Speak up. Yeah, I'll be sure I can hear you. His question is, if he's an elder, can he be a part of a team also? But you cannot be a team leader. You can be a part of a team, absolutely. Right now, we have we have some of our elders who also are on the team, but they cannot be the team leader because they're an elder. All right, good question. His question is, what is my wife? And here are the stipulations on that. An elder, according to the model, his wife cannot be the financial secretary because because of the, what's my word? Help me, Virgil. Conflict of interest. So if, you're, if your wife should be elected the financial secretary or the treasurer of the church as an elder, you could not. Either she can't or you can't. Because that's a conflict of interest. We had to solve that in our church. When we first began, we were little. We had a very qualified lady in our church who, who became the treasurer. Well, pretty soon her husband, we needed him as an elder. And for a while, we let that go. But as soon as we could, we, we resolved that. So it's not right for an elder, a man to be an elder, and his wife to be the financial secretary. Any more than it would be for the pastor to have his wife as the financial secretary. You can't do that. That's not a good, that's just not a good thing to do. So there are just a few, mainly in the area of finances, that it is not wise for an elder whose wife would be a leader or involved in one of those very important areas of handling the money. Does that make sense? I can't hear. Question is, could she be a light pastor or a team leader whether we're finance? Could he? Could she? She is what? The eldest one. She could be, she, oh yeah, she could be a team leader as long as it's not in the area. Virgil, is there any other area that would be a conflict of interest? He said, or a light pastor. The, the wife of a light pastor. No, be a light pastor. Uh -huh. Uh, a lady be a lay pastor? Yes, that's what he asked. No. In the cowboy model, the lay pastors are men. Now, 
I don't have that sense with you, but I'm going to keep straight with you and tell you that in the, in the cowboy church, one of the appealing things about cowboy church is that people see men up leading, men up doing the work of the Lord. Does that mean there's no place for the women? Of course not. We have in our church 22 positions that are led and held by, by the women. Women's ministry, hospitality, children's team, nursery team, church secretary, financial secretary. There are 22 positions, but lay pastor is not one of them. The elders and the lay pastors in the cowboy church model are men. Men of league. That's what the New Testament says. And the cowboy church seems to really reach men because of they see the men of being spiritual ministry leaders to the body of the, of the church. And that's the cowboy model. Now ladies, that's not an offense I hope to you. But you asked me to shoot straight and that is the cowboy model and it works. And there's lots of places for the women to serve teaching, leading teams, uh, but not lay pastor and not elder. Okay? Any other questions? Why don't we go to a breakout session and I'm going to talk to you about more detailed things that the lay pastors and the elders do like baptism and the Lord's Supper. In my church, I've been there four years and I've probably only baptized three people. I let the lay pastor and the elders do that, yes. Yes. Do you have to be a member of the church to be part of a team or, or a team leader? Two different questions. You do not have to be a member of the church to be a member of the team, no. But to be the leader in our church and according to the model, you need to be a member. Okay. Now let me give you an example. In our band, two or three of our band, when we got our church going, a couple of the guys in our band came to play with us and they were not even saved. They, they didn't even know the Lord. But they were awesome musicians and we said, come and play with us. And so they began to play. They began to hear those gospel songs. They began to hear my message. And pretty soon they baptized them. Pretty soon they made a profession of faith. And pretty soon they said, you know, I, I played all these years in different places that were not very godly. I didn't know I could have played my fiddle or my guitar or my steel in church. I never knew I could do that. And see, if we'd have said, oh, no, 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 you can't play because you're not a member, we'd have never reached them. Now, so we, yeah, you can be on a team, but not a team leader. A leader needs to be a member of the church who is going to give an account. Remember, empowerment with accountability. And if you're not a member, you're not accountable. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. That's the way we do it. Well, why don't we go to break out? Okay. And, Any other uh, questions? And we'll take some more questions okay. when you come back. Again, folks.